Uh, hello and good morning to everybody and welcome to today's talk about the future of medicine. We are witnessing the most massive worldwide health crisis in modern history. Yet, we should not forget the future is now. Why is it essential that science, business, investors, regulators and medicine collaborate? What role can Slovenian knowledge and companies play in global development? how to collaborate with multinational companies as an equal partner. Why does the state need to be advanced and empower the experts in the public and business sectors? We will try to answer most of these questions today, as we know the future of medicine is now. New technologies and treatments have arrived or are on their way. But we cannot forget the essential factor, building trust in tomorrow's medical breakthroughs. We have great speakers today, but also many experts among participants. Therefore, you are welcome to exchange your thoughts and views in the chat box. If there is a specific question for one of our guest speakers, we will send it to them after the event. Let's first take a look at the global perspective. So how do multinational companies, researchers, and investors see the future of medicine? Nicole Arming worked as a strategy consultant for different global biopharma and medtech companies in USA and Europe. She joined Roche at Pharma Division, and now she's the general manager of Roche Slovenia. Mrs. Arming, a warm welcome. How is COVID-19 is heavily impacting our health system, economy, and daily lives. How can we make sure we keep the appropriate balance between addressing the pandemic and maintaining other essential health services, respectively, a well-functioning economy? Hey, good morning, Vida and everyone. Thank you for, for hosting us. Um, I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Um, I think it's a good question. You know, um, my personal opinion, it's really not an either or. It must be an end. Um, I think if the this situation or this crisis has shown us one thing, it is that a well-functioning healthcare system is absolutely essential uh, for the survival of our society and also our economy. And I think, you know, besides all the, the, the pain and suffering that we have experienced, um, and the, the, the tragedy of COVID, we must not forget that there's other people out there who need help. Um, for example, we've seen that across Europe, cancer diagnoses have dropped in during this first lockdown about 30 to 50%. Um, and this is really severe because those patients that are not being diagnosed early, they're losing the chance for cure. And we will only see the impact of the society and economy in the years to come. I think with you know, reflecting on this, I think we're still learning. Uh, we're in, still in the middle of this crisis, um, but I think we do see great opportunities at hand um, to bring innovation. Um, what I'm really pleased to see is that, you know, there is an unprecedented level of collaboration now happening around the common goal. Um, I also see that, I would say, you know, the, the, the society and um, um, the ecosystem is, is realizing that there's innovation out there that can help us. Um, there's telemedicine being implemented. We do see different ways how to deliver care. For example, also in oncology, I can tell you from our perspective, you know, there's ways how we can, um, you know, give injections to um, patients in the home care setting, as opposed to bringing them into the hospital where they have to get infusions for several hours. And all this value of this is being recognized. Um, and lastly, I would say uh, there's a huge uh, recognition now about the importance of getting insights from health data, uh, which is very exciting. And I'm, I'm really pleased to see that because I think it will really help us to progress in future. Thank you, Nicole. I agree. We were forced basically to, to you know, to accept uh, many innovations because of this situation. Because on the other side, it will take 
some years, you know, to accept all of them. And uh, our next speaker comes from research area. Professor Miklaučić is a research program leader at the Laboratory of Biocybernetics Bio and a full professor at the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, University of Ljubljana. Professor Miklaučić got several national and international awards for his research work and is an ambassador of science of the Republic of Slovenia. Professor Miklaučić, you are an internationally recognized scientist. Can you please tell us what are you most proud of on which achievement that has succeeded globally? And I guess my colleague will share some slides. Good morning. Uh, good morning mm -hmm. to everybody. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Yeah, we professors, we tend to use slides to somehow hide our, our, hide our uh, face behind it. But uh, it also allows you to maybe uh, remember a little bit or understand a little bit easier the words that I'm going to try to explain. If I want to, to explain what I'm, what I'm most proud of, uh, it's, it's kind of a difficult pick, but uh, if you can show the next slide, please. I need to explain what I'm working on in the, in the, uh, for the last 25 years. Uh, the phenomenon I'm working on is called electroporation. Uh, probably most of you have not heard it, but it's it's getting into every pore of, of research, uh, uh, food processing, biomedicine, uh, and, and also in, in treatment. Both cancer, but it's also part of the uh, efforts now with the uh, uh, developing vaccine for uh, co against COVID-19. Uh, electroporation actually uh, uh, is achieved on the membrane level. Uh, we expose cell to the electric field and we can, which is, seems, seems trivial, we can kill the cell. Uh, and this can be used in, in food processing for pasteurization, but also as a tissue ablation uh, method. And I'm, I'm going to come back to that uh, uh, with, with my last slide. Uh, but if we control the parameter of pulses, this can be uh, uh, reversible, which means that the cell will be able to accept or we will be able to extract some molecules from, uh, from the cell. And that would be either small molecules or large molecules. Small molecules like some chemotherapeutics with intracellular uh, uh, target like DNA or uh, uh, plasmid DNA or RNA, which is now known as, uh, uh, and it's used for, for, is being developed for uh, 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 DNA, as DNA vaccine, RNA vaccine against COVID-19. So, and of course, there are, there are various ways how you, could, you can use that, but first you need to know how to do it. So what I'm proud of, I think uh, the next slide will, will show you what I think was my major achievement. Uh, in 2011, I submitted a proposal to European Commission to the COST uh, program uh, to uh, uh, fund a, uh, a global network that uh, I built then with colleagues, which was going on for four years, the project. Uh, at the end, we were almost 600 individual researchers from 243 institutions, 46, 46 country, 43 countries, and we had 28 companies. That actually culminated in a First World Congress uh, uh, that we organized in Ljubljana, so that will be the next slide, and that will be for the time being the, the last one. And what was really great is that for the first time, people working in so diverse fields as biotechnology, food processing, uh, medicine, engineering were brought together and we are now meeting every two years since then, hopefully next year again in, in Copenhagen. And this is, I think, what uh, can be, uh, let me say, considered as, as a major achievement for me, bringing up a community to be able to work together to develop further this uh, uh, strong uh, platform technology. Uh, thank you, Professor Miklauci. Thank you for the uh, insight of your innovation. I understand almost everything. And thank you so much. You're usually not, not a speaker for the, for the broader public. Um, but let's it's, not- It's a challenge. 
It's yeah, a challenge. I know, I know, but it, it, it was easier because of the slides. Thank you. So let's now hear the perspective of multinational company. Katja Kruvcher has been working in the pharma and medical devices industry for over two decades. She held several regional positions in Abbott and Johnson and Johnson, and now she leads medical devices company Metronic Slovenia. Katja, a warm welcome to you too. So no. the mission of Metronic is to improve lives with the power of medical technology. What does it take to bring breakthrough innovation to broader use? I know the explanation could be very long, but can you in short explain what does it sure. take? <laughs> I'll try to. Uh, so uh, thank you for the question. Indeed, like uh, for Metronic, innovation is the core of everything that we do. Um, we try to have the, the lighthouse around the mission, uh, which is to alleviate pain, restore health and extend life. Meaning that all the um, uh, innovations, all the technology around it has to have this strategic fit. And uh, of course, there is numerous of patents, number of, of technology improvements, um, clinical research. I have to highlight this one because of course, uh, when the technology gets out there, it has to be focused around patient outcomes. Uh, meaning it has to have a clinical efficiency, but also the value. So economical value that it becomes affordable and that uh, basically it can adopt a broader and um, a bigger accessibility to the patient. So thank you, Katya. Uh, now it's time to invite the first keynote listener. So Ursha Lachner is the co-chair of MCM Health Committee and Corporate Affairs Manager at Pfizer Slovenia. Ursha, a warm good morning to you too. Good morning, Pfizer everybody. and BioNTech, hi, hello, just announced that they are waiting for quick authorization in the US of their COVID-19 vaccine. You were expecting this question, weren't you? About, about the vaccine. About so, the vaccine in this topic, of course, yeah, <laughs> expect it. <one. laughs> so um, this, this um, waiting for this authorization is uh, quite remarkably quick for vaccine development. Within 10 months of detailing the genetic code, the average wait for approval is near eight years normally. When announced, it was a good day for all stock exchanges also. Are we now more uh, than ever witnessing the interdependence of science and economy, what do you think? Yes, definitely. These are remarkable uh, speed, I would say. It took us just 248 days to get from the day that we announced to plan a collaboration with uh, our collaborative uh, company, BioNTech, to actually FDA submission date. It is uh, tremendously quick. And uh, we operated this in a speed with, of course, all the clinical process, all the um, pre-preparation, which was, of course, possible just because of advanced in technology, tremendous collaboration of all parts, which were included, uh, thousands of courageous colleagues, uh, trials, volunteers actually around the world, and of course, also the purpose-driven colleagues in both companies. And everybody was just, you know, reshaping and moving to this direction. So as our CEO noted uh, in October and several times already in media, it's that our purpose is to discover breakthroughs that change patients' lives. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this breakthrough, which we are bringing now, it's really the, mo the most meaningful to greater number of people than ever when we will bring this COVID-19 vaccine. So if we say what um, this connection between economic and science was probably never so much in um, all advantages and all thoughts around the, around the world, around the globe. And uh, due to the fact that this pandemic situation disrupted societies all around the world, including small and large businesses, small and uh, big uh, national economies, it's of course in every aspect, uh, all technologies come together to, to bring uh, the, these breakthroughs and the solutions on plate on the for, first, uh, let's say solving situation. Mm -hmm. And as we say, science will win for sure and we will over, also overcome the situation and become 
let's say, in new normal, probably not the same as it was, but definitely we are coming uh, with uh, uh, scientific solutions to this. Thank you, Usha. This is really very quick, but we are forgetting forgetting many times that pharma companies, you are investing a huge amount of resources into the development, but still um, you lack the trust of the population, you know. So how, how would you say, how can you build trust towards the patient, towards the broader public? Yes, unfortunately, you're right. Vida, especially in uh, these uh, vaccines or immunization uh, let's say, field, we face uh, a lot of distrust from the general public uh, and occasionally it occurs and grow a lot. But I can say that especially in these times, this pandemic maybe put the deep, different perspective and it was really um, a big, tremendous, um, let's say, uh, progress done also where uh, there were CEOs of nine countries uh, make a, together some signature to the pledge uh, which was, uh, you know, to outline actually the united commitment to uphold the full integrity of the full scientific and later uh, producing process, so that towards these potential regulatory filings and the full uh, measurement of the safety in the first place will be the most important. And these nine companies are big pharma companies dealing with vaccines. So AstraZeneca, BioNTech, GlaxoSmithKline, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Moderna, Novavax, Pfizer, and Sanofi. I mean, they're really big companies and CEOs uh, make these promises to the uh, public. So what would move forward the trust and to increase the, the let's say, belief in the efficiency and safety of vaccination uh, will be, of course, to uh, make, to increase a big awareness of the importance of what vaccines brought to the society already in the past. And this will be done only with collaboration with the patient organizations and medical and public health institutions and all authorities around the world. So uh, from this uh, Pfizer, but as well also other uh, companies who are dealing with the uh, vaccine, are uh, collectively actually trying to uh, organize and uh, being a partner then to, with the patient organization, governments uh, in the Europe is let's say also European Commission, the one who is uh, the partnering the, uh, this, so Slovenia is also part of this, but in general full uh, all around the globe, there are governments uh, coming to the, uh, let's say partnering and discussing mm -hmm. and building the trust and increasing awareness of why vaccines are important and why immunization uh, can bring a uh, solution for the current situation. Yeah. Thank you, Ursha, and thank you also for your and Andre's work at our health committee. And we'll definitely monitor the decision of a FDA and we hope it will change our lives back to the old times or back to the normal times. So an innovation require a huge investment in technological development and also into commercialization. Anne Lurie Manier is an investment di director at Apposit Capital. The company solely focuses on investment in healthcare. Mrs. Manier is involved in originating, executing and managing assets. Mrs. Ma Manier, uh, good morning uh, good and hello to London. Hello, thanks for having me this morning. Hello, everyone. Thank you for accepting our invitation. So, uh, Mrs. Manier, how do investors decide? How much do you invest in technological development before the innovation comes to, to the broader public, to the patient? Sure. So um, I think first and foremost, um, there are two pillars usually in, in the way we look at investment. The first pillar is, is obviously, you know, the technology and what it would bring um, either to patient or to the health system in terms of improving patient journey or improving patient's outcome or to the pair, um, the system in, in, in enabling better pathways or savings. But also, you know, as an investor, we also back a team and we help a team grow a company. So obviously the quality of the team um, is, is very important. Um, we do sometimes help, you know, bringing new people into, into a company's team, but, um, you know, obviously the, the quality of the team is very important. So that the two pillars that we look at. 
thank you, Mrs. Manier. And um, I'll uh, ask you another question after a couple of minutes. And we invited also three leaders. So the three organizations uh, that are cooperating, like Usha uh, Lachner mentioned, uh, together to make this event great for all of you, for all uh, the listeners today and participants. So Mr. Balash Furiash is the CEO at EIT Health Innostars. Innostars is one of the seven geographical areas of the EIT Health Network and covers half of Europe. Innostars focuses on promoting entrepreneurship, innovation, and education in health healthy living and active aging in the region. Mr. Furish, a good morning to you. Good morning. So why do we need trust in the health ecosystem and how, by your opinion, can we gain it? Yeah, thank you for the question because it's a very important one. Trust is essential. So in, in, in these days, none of the either university or corporate or startups can have all the knowledge uh, to conquer the biggest challenges uh, these days. So even a healthcare ID compared with a best practice from the logistics world or the financial world can lead to new innovations. So therefore, we need collaboration and we need uh, trust. I see a lot of cases where a university professor, for example, has a very good ID, would like to approach VC, angel investors. Uh, and uh, after the first meeting, because there are no general terms and conditions for the cooperation, uh, the scientific person believes that uh, the business world would like to take advantage of him. So therefore, he continues uh, looking for new connections and new negotiations. And after two years, he might realize that the first one not, was not bad at all. But then the novelty of his innovation is already gone. And there are a couple of countries where it works very differently. Let me let me uh, talk about Denmark, for example. Denmark is one of the leading countries uh, in innovation. And there are two factors that help. The first one, they have a lot of social connections in uh, social settings like a core or just playing games, singing together, where there is no hierarchy. So the professor is meeting with a Uber driver, the VC manager is meeting with a technical pe person, and because there is trust, there are no hierarchy, they, they, are, they, they share their ideas freely. And by sharing ideas, by developing new connections, weak links, that is how innovation is coming. The other example might be Israel, uh, where uh, due to the trusted network of the army, uh, because they served in the army together, and there was again no hierarchy, there's absolutely meritocracy, meritocracy they immediately know whom to talk and they can talk freely. So I already uh, um, experienced that when we have an ID and we are at drafting the first email, they already set up the startup and they are running. So you need trust in order to share IDs and to speed up the flow of information because otherwise you cannot build up this interdisciplinary, intercompany, uh, networks that can foster innovation. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, you need to communicate also the, the good argument to gain trust, but that will be a topic for another meeting. So thank you so much. And we'll jump to another topic. Katya, please. Uh, Katja, speed it up a little bit. Uh, our next topic is Slovenia, and I would like to begin with a question. So what role can Slovenian knowledge and companies play in global development? Professor Miklaučić, some, some says that Slovenes are a nation of innovators. Can you briefly explain, explain the path of technological development from innovation to broader use? Mr. Miklaučić. Thank you. So, first of all, I agree Slovenians are extremely resourceful. Uh, that can be good and bad. I mean, you can see the situation we are currently in. And in part, this is because we are so resourceful, avoiding 
you know, guidance uh, limitations in, in, in any possible way. But also, of course, we are capable of dealing with this situation because we are resourceful. And that comes, of course, also with, with uh, uh, innovation, yeah? Uh, how to bring innovation from the innovator to, let me say, to the full use, it's, it's, it's a different story. And I don't think we have in the past uh, created in Slovenia the, 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 the supporting infrastructure sure. to do that, actually. So here is uh, uh, a part of uh, a story that I was brought into uh, because I was, I was recognizing the combination, the potential of the combination of electroporation and chemotherapy uh, back in 1989, uh, as our colleagues in France have published, uh, uh, presented actually at the World Cancer Congress as an in vitro result. Yeah, just showing that the specific drug, which is not considered very good and very efficient, it's called bleomycin, uh, plus it's off, off patent, how with electroporation, which I explained before, it's put its, it's uh, cytotoxicity is, is potentiated 1,000 to 10,000 times uh, uh, fold. So it's, it's really hugely limited its effectiveness by the plasma membrane, by the membrane of the cells. And electroporation does change that. So this was actually uh, uh, the, the first publication, if now we look back, it was in 1988, 1987. In 1992, I contacted uh, uh, finally and visited the colleagues in Paris at the Gustave Roussy, and we started to work together and also with other colleagues and so on. And in 90s, we were already entering into first clinical trials together with the uh, 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 Institute of Oncology, uh, Professor Rudolf Zvone was at that time uh, uh, director of the uh, Institute with Gregor Sersha. And we were somehow uh, seeing in incredible responses, you know, 70% complete response of, after a single treatment. And so I was convinced that this must get, you know, in, in somehow, into, into, uh, into the general use in hospitals. Unfortunately, there was no company interested in Slovenia uh, in you know, investing this. Either they didn't believe that this is really interesting uh, or true, or they were at that time mainly focusing on you know, privatization uh, and, and you know, economic gain within two years of 50%, things like that. Those were really dynamic years. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were lucky in a way to then, I identified actually then after uh, failing finding a company in Slovenia, I identified a company in Italy, a small medium enterprise company that I knew from before. It was funded by uh, a professor, former professor from, uh, 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 from uh, Bologna University. And so in 2000, we were happy enough to get the first uh, project uh, uh, from European Commission uh, the fifth, within the fifth framework program was three years and a half, which was backed up later with the demonstration project of two years, which was extended for another year. So 2006, we got the, the whole consortium was proud to get, uh, you know, the device with the C marking as a medical device with the standard operating procedures on the market on 2006. And now you see how from 2006, we went through a crisis in 2010, we are now in 2020. And if anybody knows about the cancer, uh, these numbers are, are terribly low and it's only used mainly in Europe. So why is that? I mean, how, how, can, how can it be that we have such, such a, efficient treatment and it really does not uh, uh, develop into a, uh, uh, a product that is being fully used and, and widely used in cancer treatment. And for cancer, I think it's it's easy uh, explanation, especially for Europe. Europe is fragmented uh, uh, market, so you need to address each country separately, even though we are all together. Yeah, And, and second, 
the problem is that uh, uh, cancer is actually not a single disease. It's, it's 100 different diseases. So you need to address each of them separately because each of them is being treated by different medical doctors. So if we just uh, turn the next slide, our involvement and our effort uh, in this was, was tremendous. We, we, did, we virtually did in our lab, we were trying to support on every step, both from in vitro experimentation, supporting in vivo experiments, uh, uh, doing experiments together with the colleagues from the ECD Oncology, developing hardware electrodes for companies, developing uh, things uh, like ECRF to collect data in multicentric clinical trial that was run, helping defining the standard operating procedures, you know, systematic reviews, meta-analysis. And since 2008, developing treatment planning for treating deep-seated tumors, because all of that was for skin metastasis, including the teaching uh, material, training material. So all of that, I mean, is, 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 is a little bit, I, I would say, overwhelming. And still, I'm, uh, I'm feeling frustrated because this is really not going very well. Uh, the problem is that in this medical technology field, enormous money has to be poured in, first in the development, then in, of course, approval processes, and finally in developing the market. And that requires not only enormous amount of time, but also enormous, uh, sorry, not only enormous amount of money, but also enormous amount of time. And that usually we, is measured in tens of years. And that is where I think researchers, but also small companies are having uh, lots of difficulties in understanding. And also I think the investment capital has a lot of better choices to, inv to invest uh, uh, than in, in, in health technology. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Miklaucic for an insight. It's really a long and and uh, uh, procedure with lots of efforts within. But I have another question for you. Um, so, um, what is, by your opinion, are we Slovenes accepting innovations quickly, either in institutions or the broader public? Well, if if we now if we can go, I mean, in in, in different places. Uh, so. Phones, yes, we do accept phones. Uh, internet, yes, we do accept internet. Uh, if we stay in the medical, uh, let us say, uh, community, introducing new treatment uh, through our health insurance, uh, it's almost uh, mission impossible because they don't give new money. Uh, they let the, the medical providers they to just decide. Pay for, pay for a treatment, yeah. Yes, but not only that, it's, it's, it's pretty much everywhere in, in, in the, let me say, public sector. If you want to do something new, you need to give up something else. So you have the, 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 the box or, or the, the glass uh, of, of, of uh, resources and money, and you can now use this and introduce new things, or, uh, but you have to give up something else something that is already being implemented and still useful and so on, because there's no, this is the same with the teaching program at the universities, this is the same. Because I've, I've seen also how they evaluate. So for example, just because I'm diabetic, I now have uh, from, from Abbott the, free, uh, the, the Libre Freestyle. Mm -hmm. You know, Slovenia is the last one in Europe who actually introduced that through the uh, uh, insurance. And, and why is the last one? Well, because we don't have, I think, the right procedures to decide what is bringing them benefit and, and at which part. We are somehow stuck in, 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 in time and we have difficulties in moving. Yeah? At one point, it's good, it's good for us. So, for example, if we can have intracardiac catheter and, or ultrasound that we can reuse, then the, the, the price approved is good because we can reuse it. The moment we cannot reuse it anymore, the price from the, 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 the insurance company is, is not sufficient. But we cannot change that. 
because we were happy 10 years ago, we still need to be happy because you cannot move the borders in, in Slovenia. Yeah? Everybody's protecting the yard. So going to your question, are we easy to accept innovations? No. And I, I think it's, 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 uh, we're one of the worst ones in, in, in systematically accepting. The nation, the nation of innovators, but we are not accepting innovations quickly. Yes, and I think we are forced to do innovations to avoid that. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we have uh, also today with us the representative of the Health Insurance Institute in Slovenia. Uh, uh, Mr. Plesnicar, and maybe he will answer uh, your question or, or comment what you said about, about the um, health, health institution afterwards. But now I think it's a great opportunity that we have with us uh, Anne Lurie Menier because she is a representative of the uh, opposite capital, so an investor. So Mrs. Menier, how can a Slovenian researcher or entrepreneur reach an investor like you, like Apposite Capital? Well, we've, um, you'd be surprised, but we've got, um, I mean, we cover Europe from, um, you know, from London, but we, we do receive inbounds from, you know, companies, you know, across Europe. So, you know, um, we haven't done an analysis, but I think, um, you know, at least, you know, 12 or 15 countries, um, you know, all sort of um, usual inbounds that we receive. Um, I mean, just, you know, hopefully a, a, a few words of advice for, you know, Slovenian company trying to reach out to us or any investor is really um, to have a plan, because I think what an investor um, is, is after is, is trying to understand the vision of the team and trying to understand um, where the team is, is, is trying to go, is, is uh, the goal they're trying to achieve. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, um, an investor will, will partner with with the with the company for a number of years. Um, I mean, um, you know, it's been said that um, innovation in healthcare and investment in healthcare is multi years, is a long term in um, you know long term partnership. So, um, so you know, and it goes back to the trust. You know, trust needs to be built between the investor and the company that um, it invests in. But yeah, um, I think going back to your question. Um, the, the team needs to have a, a plan and a goal um, and, and eventually it'll be shared by the investor that invests in the company. I think that's the main the first step. Yeah, and you are not investing into startups, but uh, in late stage, in the companies exactly. that are in the late stage. Uh, so we generally invest in um, um, commercialization. So once the, 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 the technology or the innovation is past clinical stage, and it's going into 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 patients really um, at scale. Uh, which areas are now uh, your priority? Which are the hot areas now that you are the promising areas in healthcare that you are investing now? Sure. So, well, we're trying not we're trying to stay agnostic in the subsectors that we look at because at the end of the day, our paradigm of investment is, um, you know, making a, a difference in patients' life or um, enabling some savings or, or some improvements in this healthcare system, or hopefully both. Um, but but um, you know the subsector that we obviously um, currently look at and are very hot are digital health. You know health IT, all the sort of softwares and um, you know wearables and, and sort of tracking, monitoring systems as well. And and obviously um, um, COVID nineteen accelerated some of the trends that we'd been seeing. Um, before, i.e. sort of, um, you know, remote setting, monitoring, um, um, digitization, etc. But, but I think this is accelerating and that these are trends that we, we look at, you know, we look at with interest. So we'll, we'll send all the, the, the interesting companies to you. I'll be back. Definitely, I'll be very uh, interested. Uh, to, you, to you after a while. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. So, uh, Mrs. Klopchar, how is the introduction of innovative therapies regulated in Slovenia? How long does it take for the method or therapy to become a standard care in Slovenia? Uh, hi, Vida. Um, I can definitely agree with everything that Professor Miklaucic pointed out and Anne Lurie. It's a long way before we actually get to the readiness to have all the clinical data and everything that can prove patient outcomes. 
And then we get to this little uh, moment, uh, which is called market access. And for that, um, I'm, I'm very happy and privileged to have worked with um, tremendously active and um, uh, medical experts that, that have this instant um, love with the technology that can improve the outcomes with the patients, uh, meaning lesser pain, lesser complication, lesser um, hospital stay, lesser sick leaves, uh, any innovation in this field, particularly where the technology is uh, dominant, like in surgery, uh, it, it's of vital importance and, and sort of innate um, relationship that happens between a medical expert and the company. And then, of course, in Slovenia, if I relate back to the specific questions, we have this system of introduction that sometimes is a little bit unclear and takes a lot of time and has to do around, um, in my personal view, lack of health technology assessment uh, uh, methods. Meaning, when the company has a new technology and when basically it's introduced and then has the clinical evidence and medical community is in sort of yes to adopt it, then we have to struggle with the barriers that often are endlessly long, uh, um, sometimes unclear in who's uh, taking the decision and uh, who has the accountability to get them on the list of the reimbursed um, 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 therapies that can, in the end, become a clinical guidelines and uh, something that uh, medical users uh, can simply adopt. So this is something where I, uh, where I see also from the benchmark in the healthcare system in uh, around European countries that we like to benchmark with, uh, as something where Slovenia could actually improve. So that all the technology at hand could become um, um, assessed also through the local cost centers, uh, because the Clinical efficiency by all means is there when, when it's regulated and has all kinds of regulatory approvals. Um, so that the introduction uh, from economical viewpoint becomes uh, a little bit more fast and a little bit more beneficial to, to the patient in need. Thank you, Katja. So uh, definitely a lot of room for improvement. Yes. In that area. <laughs> so we heard Professor Miklaučić um, um, what would you say, how can, can uh, a company, a scientist, a group of scientists, how can they arouse interest by the global corporation like, like Metronic? Is it possible to, to cooperate with, with the Metronic if you come from Slovenia, you are a scientist, you have an innovation, a breakthrough innovation? Katja, Slovchar. Um, definitely. So Metronic's doors are open for expert scientists uh, on a global scale. So the competition there is uh, quite intense, I would say. But nevertheless, we have experienced a uh, very nice collaboration where actually a Slovenian knowledge or uh, a patent uh, can, can contribute to, uh, in my view, tremendous uh, change and shift into how the patients are treated today. Um, meaning that we go from very open surgery into a very minimal invasive surgery that has tremendous benefits for a patient and its quality of life. So how to measure that is something that I uh, referred in the previous uh, um, yeah. um, uh, discussion. But, but um, what I'm trying to say is that anything that has value to patient outcome and anything that can be translated into technology, of course, by all means, um, um, has the interest of any company that wants to be in the leadership side of technology. Thank you. Thank you, Katja. And uh, also MCHAM Slovenia members had the pleasure to visit your headquarters in the States. And we were impressed with what the work that you are doing to benefit patients. So thank you, Katja, for now. Thank and you. we have another keynote listener among our speakers. I hope Andre, uh, Mr. Andre Plisnicar is with us today. Uh, Mr. Plisnicar. Yes, I have to. Uh, I have to unmute myself. Huh, Am I great, here? Great. Do you hear me? 
Yes, I can hear you. And I will <laughs> just say a, a few words about you and then I'll ask you the question or you can comment what your predecessors uh, said till now. Well, uh, let's start, let's just start with commenting. Okay. First of all, I, <laughs> I do come from Health Insurance Institute, but I'm not a representative. So I would like to, let me say, uh, start with quoting Chatham House rule. So I will speak in my name. And uh, so please, um, Health Insurance Institute has a very good public relations uh, office. And I think many questions can be uh, uh, given there. But as an insurance company, it has to be resilient. It has to be effective in its decisions and it has to be accessible to all. So you see, there are already problems coming out. It's true that the procedures are cumbersome, are taking a lot of time, but there are procedures. No doubt they can be improved. But uh, for example, we still do not have a really our own HTA agency. So let me say, why not look to the EU? Why not look to the broader, with a broader perspective? Why not uh, start, uh, for example, uh, with using unit HDA or something like this? And uh, there are not, and there are other issues that probably many of you do not know. What about fair pricing? What about accessibility? What about transport? What about storage of, uh, uh, of uh, medicines? What about, uh, for example, um, uh, production of medicines? And uh, uh, what about SPCs uh, that also come, uh, for example, uh, into picture? And uh, of course, uh, there are many, many things to solve. But what I would like to emphasize is the quote by Ms. Klopchar. Um, she said something very, very important. And I think we should take it as a, some kind of uh, guiding light uh, in our decisions for future. The centrality of a human being, the centrality of a citizen, and uh, with all the news in technology, with P4 medicine, with, uh, let me say, genomics, proteomics, and so on, uh, we can really start looking after wellness, after health, not only treating people, but keeping them healthy. And uh, then we should also, uh, let me say, try to overcome any ideological barrier that exists. And there are many in Slovenia. Basically, our uh, payment system is still a fee-for-service system. If you want to go in the direction that Ms. Klopcher somehow presented, then we have to change the, the mind, our minds, and then we have to discard the ideology and start being practical. Changing uh, minds and mindset is a difficult, uh, the most difficult task of all. But Mr. Plisicer, if you allow me, I will say a few words about you. And then we can talk about innovations, if you, if you agree. So Mr. Andre Plesnichar is an advisor at the Health Insurance Institute of Slovenia, but he is also a medical doctor by profession with a scientific master's degree in clinical oncology and a specialization in social medicine. Before work for the largest health insurance company in Slovenia, Mr. Plesnichar worked at medical institutions in Slovenia in Italy. And we decided when we talked this week uh, on a phone that we will not talk about finances, the healthcare system, but we'll talk about innovation. So, and innovative treatment. So Mr. Plesnichar, how to establish a healthcare system uh, that will give the best possible results for the patient? You explained to me uh, on the phone, very, you know, very simple. Can you explain that to the audience, please? Well, uh, I think that uh, already Ms. Klopchar said it very, very well. So what the patient is interested in is gaining, recovering, or staying healthy, become healthy after disease, after illness, after uh, injury. And uh, this is something that presents value for him or her. So this puts, us, uh, this puts the patient into the central position in all the systems. And... Uh, it's, uh, I mean, we talk a lot about it. The, for example, patient-centeredness is always in our media, but actually not much is done about it. Uh, and I believe the systemic changes will be greatly spurred on 
if the uh, providers of technology and healthcare, and please note, health and care are two different words, uh, start uh, with lobbying, start with peddling their influence, start with, uh, uh, start with information, because uh, I can tell you that uh, things will not change by themselves, especially not at Health Insurance Institute. And uh, uh, I think that uh, once again, put the people in the center, look about their wellness, look about their health, and uh, let's try to find out what is a real value to them. And I think, for example, that uh, I was mentioning ideology, and there are a lot of problems with public-private partnerships in our country. There shouldn't be any, because if we return to Medtronic, Medtronic owns, for example, a whole uh, chain of uh, uh, diabetes uh, outpatient clinics in Holland, and they're the best in Holland. And why not here? Who knows? Let's ask ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Plesnicer. Can I quote your remark about the public-private partnership? Because yes. we are struggling with that area yes. for so many years. Mm -hmm. And I'm so sorry, we don't have much time, but as we uh, uh, both agreed, we'll invite you to be our guest speaker also in the future because we have so many questions for you. But thank you for today and we'll be in touch. So, uh, Mrs. Arming, you are a general manager of Rose Slovenia and after a year here, you probably have a clear picture of Slovenian health ecosystem. What do you consider the biggest strengths and opportunities for our uh, healthcare ecosystem, Nicole? Well, I think, you know, there's the exciting thing is that there's a lot of innovation happening in healthcare. And I think this innovation, you know, will not only help us to improve health, you know, and I agree with the statement, care is not the same as, as health. But it will hopefully not only help us to improve health and care and outcomes, but it, I believe there's also great opportunity actually to, to get to a more sustainable model when it comes to costs, because a lot of, of this innovation can help us to get more um, efficient. So I would say, you know, besides the innovation in, you know, medicines or treatments or diagnostics, which is part of our core business, um, I'm particularly excited about the innovation in uh, digital. I'm particularly excited about the, you know, the digitization of health data, um, because I believe real healthcare innovation these days is happening right at this intersect between you know, biology, science, genomics, IT, data science, but also technology. And I think the one thing I learned in the last one and a half years that I've been here in Slovenia is that there's amazing companies here locally. Um, there's so much innovation happening. And ironically, to what some of the speakers said before, some of these companies are getting real good traction abroad, but they're struggling to get a foot in the door here in Slovenia. Um, and I think also, so to your question, right, on the opportunities, I think there's a lot of good innovation happening here locally. Um, and I also think the point around co collaboration and trust, the point made around public-private partnerships. Um, I personally worked, you know, more than four years in the Nordic. So I've experienced also very different environment, much more open environment towards these collaborations. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this is where I see, you know, really big change um, that could, you know, that could help us. Um, so if we bring, you know, academia together with, with startups, with, you know, larger corporations, uh, the institutions, I think, you know, the, the sky is the limit. Um, and I think Slovenia, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a contained country, you know, it's quite centralized in many of its its aspect. So I think it has the, the potential and the opportunities to actually leapfrog. You know, it's not a big cumbersome system as, you know, a Germany or France. It has the opportunity to leapfrog in some of these aspects and become one of the most innovative, uh, you know, healthcare countries in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. You are so passionate when you speak about, you know, collaboration and cooperation and that is yeah. so great to hear. So um, I heard some, some rumors 
but I will ask you like this. Uh, does Rouge as a global company cooperate with any of Slovenia and those innovative companies that you mentioned? Well, of course, um, yes. So we're, you know, we're very active in the community of Health Day, um, which is really exciting. There's a lot of amazing companies in there and there's a number of projects that we're exploring together. Some of them hopefully might move into proof of concept quite soon. But also, you know, we're obviously very interested in collaborations with academia um, or other parts of, of you know, the, 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 the society. Um, so, yes, I mean, the, the clear answer to it is yes, with an exclamation mark. And be sure to share that great news if something will come to a result with us so we, we can share that with the audience at the next event. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I have a representative here uh, from, I would say, startup com community and academia. So Jakob Gajšek is the director of Ljubljana University Incubator. The incubator helps startup coming from both academia and students to enter the market and reach their potential. And uh, uh, Ljubljansk Universitetni Incubator is also our partner at today's event. Jakob, hello. Hi. Uh, how are you? It's, it's been a great I'm event great. so far. I'm great. Uh, so the same question as I asked uh, uh, Mr. Um, uh, uh, Balash is mm -hmm. for you. So why do we need trust in the health ecosystem and how can we gain it by your opinion? Well, if you ask me, I'm going to focus a little bit more on the general health ecosystem rather than just innovation as, as Balash did. Uh, so I think that trust is the basis of having a good healthcare ecosystem simply because, you know, people will not go to a doctor and really be open and so on if there's no not a trusted relationship between them. Uh, you can see, for, for instance, what is happening now with the, with the COVID vaccine, which hopefully, you know, will be the thing that turns our lives back to normal again. But you know, there is a lot of pushback. Um, apparently, you know, there was some data that you know, almost half of Slovenes would not want to uh, be vaccinated, which I feel is a, the symptom of a much larger problem of just generally not trusting scientific results or actual experts. Um, and uh, I honestly, it is a major problem currently that, that we are facing as uh, as a, as a species, I would say. Um, and I think if, if there is no one way how you can solve it. Uh, however, if we are consistent and transparent with communication and, and open and, you know, show that what can be done effectively, you know, now we're, we're getting a vaccine done uh, in, in a record record short time, which is uh, fantastic. And it, there needs to be kind of understanding by the general populace of why this is the case, why this can be done and how things can move very quickly if there is will, if there is need. Um, so it is, I think, you know, COVID can be an excellent opportunity to kind of uh, for a rebuttal of a lot of um, science skepticism and vaccine skepticism specifically and so on because there will be very tangible results you know everybody moving out of being locked in our houses and, and out and about again so um, it is absolutely an opportunity um, so yeah I think as, as I started uh, you know that that um, trust and and Believe perhaps in the in the healthcare ecosystem is very much needed in order for it to function. Even uh, so, I think everybody has to be quite patient uh, when we're dealing with people who maybe don't have that trust, because sooner or later, you know, everybody comes into a position when when we see that things actually work pretty well. It's just general climate right now is not necessarily well well accepting of that fact. And I think on, on the on the here we do actually I think have the case of a silent majority of people who you know think that generally things are fine, and and maybe a little bit more transparency would be great. But um, you know that we are consistent and and open, and eventually things will sort out. But we need to be mindful about them. I hope so, uh, Jakob. Uh, in spring, the things will sort out. But it's really I would agree. It's a challenge for all human race, this situation. 
Thank you very much. And now we can see the trust um, presentation, Katya, or not. We made it. So uh, the last section is trust. Um, we spoke about that with Jakob and with, with some of you already, but I'm today um, happy and honored that we have with us Peter Gershak, State Secretary at the Ministry of Public Administration. Uh, Peter, uh, Mr. Peter Gershak, or Peter, uh, because we know you for many, many years, um, we are happy and honored to have you here. And thank you so much. I know your schedule is quite tight. Thank you so much that you uh, joined uh, here today. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, thanks for, for inviting me. It's my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Mr. Gershak previously worked for IBM and Oracle for several years and has more than 20 years of experience in IT technologies and solutions. He joined the Ministry of Public Administration this year as a state secretary. So, Peter, given the importance of personal data protection, especially if you look on health data, what is your cross-border data sharing position? Yeah, okay, Th thanks for the question. It's a great one, yeah. Um, so, first of all, to set the stage, we all know that the, <clears throat> the data are our new gold, yeah? So, do you protect your belongings? Yes, you do, actually, yeah. And at the end, I will... Um, I have a nice uh, use case about that. <clears throat> but if I put um, EU, uh, European Commission Googles on and uh, referring to, to GDPR and uh, healthcare data, so the general uh, data protection regulation is saying that the health, health data are actually special category of personal data, yeah? Uh, for which the processing is allowed only in, in 10, for 10 use cases, yeah? Mm -hmm. So, um, you see here is uh, some even special focus put on, on, on the personal data, yeah, which is special category health data. So I understand actually your uh, question about the cross-border data sharing in, in two ways, yeah? Uh, firstly, sharing a patient data cross borders within the EU, let's put it all, all wider maybe, yeah? uh, in terms of delivering healthcare service to a patient uh, so that, you know, that the patient, his health history has to be. Uh, Peter, you are, you are mute. Can you unmute? Something happened. When yeah, my fingers, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking, you know, <laughs> I'm talking with my hands. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I'm, I don't know where, where you, uh, what was the last thing you heard me, but I was talking about that uh, sharing a patient data cross border for the sake of uh, treatment of patient, yeah. Uh, um, this, is, this is something which, which will be possible within the EU in a few years time, I believe. With the new, uh, I mean, it's not new, it's, it should be already implemented in, in the EU countries. Maybe you're aware of EIDAS regulative, uh, where uh, with European, let's put it white, uh, electronic identity. So you could uh, go with your electronic identity to whatever country and you know, authorize uh, somebody to, or to do whatever uh, electronic service. So this can be basis for, you know, accepted, having a healthcare treatment, whatever in the Europe with all the data needed, yeah, for the, this treatment. Um, and secondly, what, what I um, see in the cross-border data sharing is maybe even, I wouldn't say more important, but equally important is the shared aggregated uh, data. Uh, in which, of course, aggregated means they are anonymized, uh, uh, pseudonymized uh, for the sake of statistics or the research, yeah? And as Professor Miklaucic mentioned uh, earlier, Europe is extremely fragmented, yeah? Uh, so to join these fragments, um, the European strategy for uh, data uh, 
will create in the future, uh, let's put it single data market, yeah? And the um, creation of this so-called uh, industrial data spaces will include also healthcare. It's, it is extremely important uh, uh, to improve the healthcare. And this is the way how Europe will uh, respond as well. And then um, just for example, uh, maybe, maybe you know that uh, Slovenia has one of the oldest and probably um, most comprehensive uh, cancer disease uh, register. It is, uh, I think, uh, around 70 years old and digitalized. So this is talking about the, the, the national gold. This is actually the national gold, yeah. So we see that the personal healthcare data are of really extreme importance. There is a special focus also in the country, uh, in, in Europe, Europe, and needs to be shared very cautiously. Here is a question, who is the owner of the data? Is it me as a patient or is it, you know, the institutions? Uh, still pending here, I think so. And uh, of course, sharing this cross-border, uh, cross countries, there has to be even wider uh, and more cautiously focus on that. Thanks, back to you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Uh, another quick question, because we are talking about yeah. also trust in health ecosystem. Um, and of course you are from the Ministry of Public Administration and you are, you are dealing with those, how to gain trust with, you know, with the nation each day. So how can the trust be achieved within the health ecosystem by your opinion? I know you are not from the Ministry of Health, but uh, uh, can you answer this question, Peter? Um, yeah, I will answer it more from the, from the point of IT. Mm -hmm. I will not talk about technology, but it is, you know, implicitly technology is there. Um, first of all, we all know that the Tra earning trust is slow process, losing trust is very quick process, yeah? So that's something we have to be all aware of. Um, uh, but what, what does it mean, you know, um, trust, you know? Uh, Ms. Ursula Lachner mentioned it, it's interlacing between science, uh, regulatory, proce regulatory processes and governments and so on, um, as well, um, um, Mr. Geisek uh, mentioned it in, 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 a, in a broader consent. Uh, so, but let's, let's imagine healthcare in next 10, 15 years, yeah? From now, from IT perspective. I think we will, we will have a healthcare IT systems which will be based on highly inclusive, highly trusted and timeline complete patient health uh, record information, yeah? Uh, so this patient health information record should be of, of a high trust in high and high confidence and be available anywhere, any place, and from anywhere. And it will include all the interactions a patient had in the past across complete timeline, across all relevant service networks and points of, of healthcare delivery. So it is complete, it's available in real time from any location, it's secure, compliant, so, and it's trustful, yeah? And that's that mean, that what it means trust from the from the from the IT. So that's what we need to achieve in 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 terms of of, of trust and, and and technology. Uh, Peter, thank you so much. Thank you for your time, and of course we wish you a great success in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, um, now I would like to ask. All of you, all the speakers, I will kindly ask you to answer uh, as briefly as possible, Katja Klopchar, uh, again about trust. So building trust in new medical treatments is crucial. How to get buy-in from stakeholders in the healthcare system and from patients, by your opinion? Well, the technology that we are actually focused on, um, I will be very brief. Imagine the trust needed that you, as a doctor, put the patient on a lifetime medical device, such as, uh, for example, an insulin pump or a pacemaker or um, a heart. Um, there has to be trust, and trust is based on evidence-based. So all the clinical data, all the reliability, all the accountability that technology absolutely has to prove, 
And then, of course, the trust, I guess, comes naturally in, in um, being close with, with, with those who need it. I mean, I mean, it comes to my mind now uh, when, you, uh, when you were answering this question. We trust the Facebook, but we don't trust the pacemaker. It's kind of, you know, a weird, weird uh, situation. Thank Indeed. you, Katya. Thank you Thank for your answer and uh, looking forward to cooperate with you in a uh, healthcare area also in the future. Thank you. So Nicole, uh, almost the same uh, question to you. Um, so you, you see trust as one of the fundamentals to drive innovation. So how can we build this trust by your opinion? Uh, as, as others have said before, you know, trust is built over, over time. Um, I, I would more answer it from a personal side. I think I personally build trust through dialogue, through conversations. Um, and what certainly helps is if you, if you share common values and also if you share a common goal. And I think in this case, you know, uh, we all share certain common values around, you know, appreciation for science, you know, um, you know, appreciation for, for innovation, but with the, the strong sense of putting the patient, uh, in this case, in, in the center. Um, it's about, you know, not only improving the system for ourselves, but also for, you know, our kids and, 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 and our families. So I think there's a lot that we have in common. That's a good basis for building trust. And, you know, from my perspective, it's just about giving it a try. I think it's on all of us to lean in, um, not only to have a dialogue, but actually, you know, reach out and look for opportunities to collaborate. Um, and I think through these collaborations over time, the trust will come, you know, naturally. Thank you, Nicole. So collaboration, cooperation, we are on the same page. So thank you, Nicole. And looking forward to work and cooperate with all at Rouge Slovenia in the future. So thank Mrs. Mrs. Thank you, Nicole. Mrs. Minier, when investor invest, how uh, do you build trust between a company that you are investing? How do you build this trust? Sure. So um, I, I would echo what Nico just said, which, you know, um, a partnership between um, an investor and a company lasts for, for many years. So the first few months of an investment are crucial. Um, and it's, um, you know, very much a, a, around dialogue and around cooperation on, on projects. But also, um, you know, we obviously... At the point when um, we would invest, we um, would have um, an understanding with the, with the team on what we're trying to achieve in five, six, seven years. Um, and really, you know, collaborating into moving in that direction, obviously build trust over time. And, you know, the, the first, as, as I mentioned, the first few, few weeks are key. And it's really, you know, delivering on what we'd, we'd agreed, you know, for example, as an investor, you know, if we'd said, well, you know, we'll be able to, to bring in, bring to the table, you know, this type of profile or these people, you know, delivering on those promises, I guess, build trust and on the side of the company, obviously, you know, achieving sort of milestones and um, is obviously key to, to build trust. But, but yeah, it's, it's very much dialogue and, and collaboration. I would very much echo that. Uh, thank you, and lori and I hope to see you next year in Slovenia. So... My our invitation is here. Uh, please do come as so uh, as we heard today, um, we'll, we'll uh, get vaccine and then uh, we'll be able to travel again, hopefully next year. So thank you, Anne and uh, Marie, and looking forward to, to seeing you in person. I hope uh, Professor Miklaučić is still with us because I would like to ask uh, you, Professor Miklaučić, um, do Slovenes trust Slovenian scientists and knowledge? Uh, well, yeah, first of all, th there are so many things that I do not agree with what was said. Uh, just as a challenge I, to I everybody. Can, I can give you three minutes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. No, I, it's just for, not everybody goes away so uh, happy and content. Yeah, just to, to, to reflect on the future of, of medicine, because that's okay. the title okay. of the event. I think, first of all, the trust is a personal feeling. So it, it, it's only a personal experience uh, that, will, that will bring that. So we need to work on that. And it's easy when, when the two people meet yeah, in, in person. That 
can be built. Yeah, but of course it can be uh, uh, ruined uh, as well. And once ruined, it's going to be very difficult. And if we experience, you know, we have a saying, uh, uh, one bad coin will corrupt 100 good coins uh, in Slovenian. Uh, uh, we haven't heard it for, for a very, very long time, I, I believe. So uh, we said, uh, you, we heard uh, uh, about, you know, uh, investment uh, and, and how we are ready to invest. Well, here is what I want to, to you to think about. Science has been underfunded for decades, not only in Slovenia, in Europe, worldwide. Only in situations like this pandemia, now the science is going to, to save us. But, you know, if you do not fund the science to be there when you need it, it's not there. So unfortunately, the COVID-19 came too early. Or even if it would come in 10 years, it would be probably even worse because the science has been not funded. All the programs at the EU level are not basic research and science funding, but it's applied science. So it, it, it was meant to, you know, to, to, to have a takeaway, yeah? So just, you know, you have something and you now bring it to the market. That's, that's kind of very short-sighted view. And we are going to experience that furthermore. Now this pandemic clearly showed that even the biggest companies cannot afford to develop a, a, a drug like vaccine against uh, uh, COVID-19. So, uh, different countries are pouring money into it and it's essential but this money should have been put in the science way before because we're going to find another we're going to be facing another catastrophe so we are now just pouring money to develop this vaccine maybe more than we would want to so uh, are we uh, are we uh, really uh, 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 valuing our uh, 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 knowledge. Uh, would you say? Knowledge. Yeah. Well, again, my experience, and probably comes with the age, is that no, we don't. Uh, we don't. Uh, uh, I have been in in touch with many Slovenian companies, and they simply uh, claim our knowledge and our results as theirs because they they are basically funding us through paying taxes. I'm paying taxes, so it's mine as well. So this is one problem. Uh, I think Europe generally uh, uh, is also less, I would say, generous in, in acknowledging the value for, for research. Actually, we were paid for by Slovenian companies and, and European companies to do work. Yeah? And we were considered to be too expensive, but we gave exactly the same price as German engineers or Italian engineers and so on, but we were too expensive. So we never got the business again. Uh, we never got the order again. But on the, on the contrary, American companies, they do value our knowledge. And maybe it just uh, showed the, the last slide that I prepared. I'm, I'm very happy to say, I'm very, very proud that we are developing together. We, we have been asked actually by Medtronic, approached by Medtronic. I received a phone call. Can we visit you? Can we talk to you? And I said, what about? I said, we'll sign the NDA. So they came to my office, gave me the NDA to sign, and then we started to talk. So they flew in from the States and we started to work together. They recognized from around the world that we have the knowledge that they need that they can benefit from bringing an entirely new technology in cardiac ablation to the market. And this is going to change the, the world within a within few years. All the major stakeholders, all the major companies are developing this now. And of course, Medtronic has recognized Slovenian knowledge as being crucial in this development. Now, I want to now emphasize that companies, even Medtronic, they always think that they have open door for people with innovation. This is not true. I would never find a way 
to the right people through the labyrinth of, you know, and the hierarchy of, of, of Medtronic. I'm, I'm sorry, I just wouldn't. I, I wouldn't know where to start. And I don't know where to go. And the same would be with, with Abbott and with others. Yeah, they're, if they're, they reach out, if they reach out to me, then it's easy, yeah? But in order to reach out for me, I have to be there. So the science research has to be funded. And who's going to fund this? It's not going to be investors. So it has to be the, 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 the government, yeah? So don't forget that. The science will not be there in, 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 in few years to come because everything has to turn around within two years. We need to, when we put the money in, we need to know when it's coming in. Just think about the mandate that uh, a, a, a manager has in a company. How fast do you need to produce the results? So I'm the only one actually think, uh, I think here, in the whole, uh, you know, uh, uh, participants list that I can afford to think what I will be doing in 10 years and 20 years from now. All the rest, you have to think in, in a much shorter time scale. Yeah. Sorry. So, uh, thank you, Professor Miklacic. You definitely opened some new areas and I will invite you again next year to some other talks about the the intellectual property in Slovenia, the protection of the knowledge and all of that. But thank you for today. And um, now it's time, it is my great pleasure to invite my CEO, so uh, Mrs. Aisha Vodnik, the CEO of MCM Slovenia. And